so at home, you're just going to be right at home. Uh, so our uh, reader tonight is Wendy Call, and she will be reading um, the title of her reading is Sensing the Place, Dispatches from Around North America. She served as writer in residence at 20 institutions, including Harborview Medical Center, Hedgebrook, New College of Florida, and five national parks. She co-edited Telling True Stories, a nonfiction writer's guide. Um, her book, No Word for Welcome, The Mexican Village Faces the Global Economy, won Grub Street's National Book Prize for nonfiction. Her current literary projects are supported by Four Culture and the National Endowment for the Arts. She lives in Seattle and serves on the BFA faculty of Goddard College. And her website is wendycall.com. So that was really fun because I just completely changed my mind about what I'm going to read this time. <laughs> Leo's talk. <laughs> a scene. It, it, it's like a scene. They're getting really anxious. Like, oh, I wasn't going to read a scene. <laughs> uh, but before I read a scene, um, rather than make a scene, I want to thank Kim and, and Diane for having me here. And um, I think it's so cool to be in an old shell station, especially today, when Seattle said goodbye to the yeah. uh, Shell yeah. Polar Pioneer. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to be in this show, in Operation. Um, no pollution right here. Right, well, we don't know. We don't know what's under the ground, right? <laughs> uh, I have a friend who spent a long time working in environmental re remediation uh, back when there was Texaco, back in the day. And he said, Wendy, whatever you do, don't ever eat at a gas station, or at a restaurant that used to be a gas station, which is something they do a lot, right? They, right. right? These, you know, so it's good that this is a restaurant. Um, but it's really, Nice to be in a place that has such a strong sense of place since what um, I wanted to read tonight is um, from work that has been important to me because of the places where it's located. And um, a few years ago, I came across a saying um, from the Kwakiutl people who live along um, coastal British Columbia. Um, and I came across this saying thanks to Ken Stafford, who is a really wonderful poet in Oregon. Uh, and it's the epigraph for one of his books of essays. Um, and the epigraph is, a place is a story happening many times. Uh, which is a um, little line that every time I think about it, you know, I kind of unravel other layers of meaning. And it really relates to what Theo was talking about in terms of one of the ways to really set a sense of place is to have people in the place doing something. Um, and, and letting us look at them and, and hear them and get a sense of, of them and also the space around them. And I think part of the reason that I um, became so obsessed with sense of place and this idea that a place is a story happening many times is that I grew up um, a military kid. So we moved around all the time. And I never really had a sense of the stories of the places where I lived. Uh, and now when people ask me where I'm from, I say the military. Uh, because, in a way, I didn't think about this until I heard this Kwakiutl saying, that's because my stories are really rooted in the fact that my family was moving around all the time and around other families that were moving around all the time. And so, you know, my story is the place of, you know, the U.S. military. So, um, a long time ago, um, in the late 1990s, I, um, through a very long story that I won't go into, became really interested in a part of southern Mexico called um, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which if you've looked at a map of Mexico, it's like a big funnel, and then there's a little skinny piece, and then there's the Yucatan Peninsula, like where Cancun um, and um, the Mayan pyramids are. And that little skinny piece is the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. So I wrote a book about this region of Mexico and specifically about how the people um, who live in this region we were sort of maintaining their sense of place and their sense of themselves even as the economy was changing really rapidly around them. And this is an area that had become the focus of a lot of big time um, economic activity by companies from all over the world. And I was writing about how different people were managing that situation. And this is also an area where, um, until recently, most people spoke a native language. Um, some of them spoke Spanish, some of them didn't. And one of the things that was happening, of course, is that as television came and um, people who spoke Spanish came, 
those languages were going away. And so um, the scene that I'm going to read, I'll read a little bit um, from No Word for Welcome and then a little bit about um, the writing I'm doing now, which is about national parks, uh, is a scene in the classroom of a preschool teacher. Um, there was a preschool teacher who I became completely obsessed with when I was living there because she um, was teaching her children in a language that's only spoken in her village. So the only um, materials that she had that had any writing on them were ones that she created herself. And so um, at, the, at this time, which was um, 2000, was when I met her 15 years ago, the only published books when she started teaching um, in her language were uh, the, a Spanish Ombeaz dictionary, Ombeaz was the name of the language, and the Bible. And of course, the only reason there was a dictionary was the missionaries wanted a dictionary so that they could do the Bible in their language. And she was really um, adamant that she wanted other published works in her language and that she wanted to make her preschoolers literate in their language so they could do that. So uh, this is a scene from her classroom. And this is sort of the middle of the school year, and I've been visiting her school year um, since the beginning of that year. And this is from a chapter called Peregrination. A group of women, boys, and girls stare at the camera, their faces smudged, tired. A sepia-toned early 1900s world stretches out stark and angular behind them. A cluster of simple shacks, a few mule-drawn wagons, blank dirt to the horizon. In spite of the women's tight-waisted long skirts and puffed sleeved blouses, they know hard labor. The girls' A-shaped frocks and the boys' knickers are practical, ungenerous. Charles B. Waite took this photograph, entitled Mujeres, Retrato del Grupo. I had never heard of him, but Waite is almost single-handedly responsible for my mental image of rural Mexico at the turn of the last century. A gringo who traveled throughout the country, Charles B. Waite reached the smallest villages and the farthest outposts by ox cart or mule, capturing images that would become some of Mexico's first picture postcards. Even when they first appeared, the power of his images was understood and resented. In 1901, he was arrested and jailed for sending what the authorities called indecent material through the mail. It was a photograph of two, quote, absolutely wretched boys wracked by disease. In the centuries since then, Charles B. Waite's work has been celebrated. Maritza Ochoa, she's a preschool teacher, held up a poster of Mujeres Retrato del Grupo for her preschoolers. It met the strict criteria by which Maritza decided whether government-issued Spanish language teaching materials could enter her classroom. There wasn't any text on it, and it was no more relevant to the lives of mestizo kids in Mexico City than it was to the lives of her preschoolers in her village, San Mateo del Mar. The back of the poster included a list of suggested questions that the teacher should ask the students. Where have the men gone? Why didn't the women go with them? Maritza ignored the suggested questions, of course, instead asking her students, what questions formed in their minds as they absorbed the image's details? Is that your family, Maestra? Are those three people who are wearing dresses and holding cigarettes men or women? They're men, aren't they? Because they're smoking. When Maritza related their first question to me, I laughed. How could that be her family? Later, I realized the question's logic. In their homes, photographs were valuable and rare. If people had them at all, they were of the family members closest to them. Occasionally, people would look at the photos on the walls of my little house, of dancers at a fiesta, a fisherman mending a net, children playing, and ask me, why do you have photos of people you hardly know? Maritza asked her students about Charles B. Waite's photograph. What is this group of people doing? Well, since they're all gathered around, they must be telling stories the children decided. Maritza told me all this hours later. By the time I arrived in her classroom that day in mid-April, the students had settled into their next activity, drawing portraits of their own families. 
Maritza wandered around her classroom, labeling the stick and blob people in her children's family portraits. She did my father. She did zich my grandfather. She mum my mother. She did jai my grandmother. Many of the children refer to their grandfathers as she did vida. Another example of Spanish encroaching on their language. She means my and deep man. And hombre as sich, which indicates the relationship of grandfather, had been replaced by vida, the Spanish word for life, as in the man who gave me life. So um, we'll leave Mexico there. And um, I'm going to read a little bit from work that I've done um, more recently, because that book came out in 2011. And um, since 2011, I've been spending a lot of time in uh, different national parks around the United States. I actually drove here today from Mount Rainier, um, because I'm in the middle of spending two weeks um, staying at an artist residency near Mount Rainier, so that I can write on Mount Rainier. And um, this is the sixth national park where um, I spent time as, as part of my writing. And um, I became interested in writing about national parks because one of the things that happened as a military kid was that we didn't live near family and we were always moving around and I was always the new kid in school with like the wrong slang and the wrong clothes. But one of the things we did every place we lived is we would go and visit whatever national parks were nearby. Um, and because there is actually a very close history between the National Park Service and the U.S. military, there is always a national park close to a military base. Um, and part of the writing I'm doing is kind of about that history and why that's true, um, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. Um, but the very first park where I did an artist residency was in Vermont. There is one National Park Service unit in the little state of Vermont um, in a town, called, a town called Woodstock. And they published a little chapbook, this little chapbook, which is essentially um, a collage essay um, with some photos that I took in the park at, at the end of my residency. And I was there for two months, um, and I'll tell you this just because it appears in the little piece I'm going to read, so that makes sense. I, they had me work in a historic bungalow, which was kind of a strange experience because it was essentially like working inside a museum, and I wasn't allowed to touch most of the things that were in the bungalow. And one of the things that was in there um, was this very large collection of teacups and tea saucers and fancy tea set for serving um, high tea, because this had been a, one of the summer homes of part of the Rockefeller family. And it was all hanging on a wall and designed very um, carefully, and I was scared to even go into that room, because I just felt like somehow I was going to break one of those teacups. And then in the middle of my residency, I have a goddaughter who was five years old at that time, and she came to visit me. And the whole two weeks I was thinking about these teacups. Uh, and she never, she never broke anything in that beautiful little museum bungalow. Um, but the first little piece I'm going to read from the essay, um, we're working in this bungalow. Uh, and this is called um, Amber Waves of Sound. A rock-laden truck climbs Elm Street in low gear, gravel crunches under sightseers' feet. Ladders squeak open, mo mowers grind green turf. Over it all, two birds force their song. One mower grinds closer, insistent and grating, closer, suffocating bird song. Breeze rattles leaves, birds insist on their notes. A mother, father, and son speak of mansions and flower gardens. Two cameras click. Thunder rumbles in the long distance and the moment breaks. Landscape, seascape, heartscape, soundscape. Perhaps that last is hardest to protect with so many predators encroaching on our national parks. Jet skis, chainsaws, snowmobiles, campground boomboxes, airboats, generators, snow plows, riding mowers, backhoes, and cars, cars, cars. In the Everglades, manatees skim the surface of a bay called Snakebite. Their wide skulls trapped with scars sliced by jet ski propellers. In Miami, billboards at boat launches politely request that jet ski riders stay away from the manatees. They are so tame, so torpid, so trusting. Thick black graffiti block out the billboards, polite pleas. In Northern California, lumber trucks rumble roots, driving the world's tallest trees to an early death. 
a judge finally rules, the public interest is best served by letting the ancients thrive a little longer. Government road builders want to widen the highway through a redwood grove, but the judge insists. The scale tips sharply to the safety of our 3,000-year-old redwood trees. Park rangers manage trails, gardens, endless questions, carriage roads, historic buildings, first aid emergencies, stands of pine and spruce and maple. And now they have a mandate to manage sound waves, preserve sound, eliminate noise, or at least hide it. Every week, lawnmowers as big as tractors manicure the park mansion lawn, but only after visitors have gone home for the night. On the old bungalow porch, Leslie tries to read a book as I try to begin writing one. We are both at a loss. A mechanical whine rips into our shared silence. I can't quite place the noise. Too low pitched for a weed whacker, too high for a chainsaw. Leslie abandons her book, eyes wild. Not here, she says, so much noise. I nod, catch sight of someone working his way through the hillside underbrush waving an enormous weed whacker like a dousing rod. Leslie presses her hands to her ears, her cheeks redden with alarm. Her eyes insist that I make it stop. The whine continues, oblivious. She jumps up, runs down the hillside to the line where grass meets forest. No, 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 she yells to the weed dowser. He can't hear her. He doesn't notice the child defending the soundscape her long braids whipping. And then I'll read one more shorter section from that um, little chat book. And this is called Undimmed by Tears. The year that I turned eight and the United States of America turned 200, my family took the National Parks Tour. So many landscapes and vistas and miles crammed 30 days. Yosemite and Sequoia, but not Hospital Rock. Then Mount Rushmore but not Wounded Knee, then Bryce and Zion, but not the Anasazi Village, and then the Grand Canyon, where my mother bought me a blue beaded necklace from a Hopi jewelry maker. The final national park on our tour stayed most deeply with me. I carried home the memory of the petrified forest close to our home in Cal the desert of Southern California's Imperial Valley. I carried that memory in the slickness of wood turned to stone under my calloused fingers, in the glint of petrified sap under desert sky. And I carried it home in a vial of tumbled petrified wood, an irony that was even at age seven not lost on me. I could not pick up those ancient once wood pebbles that littered the desert floor. But my father could buy a small container of them at the National Park gift shop. When we love things, we want to take them home, rather than stretch our idea of home so that it might include them. Thank you.